Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to church today, St. Paul's Wurttemberg. Now, today, according to your celebrate bulletin insert, it's the seventh Sunday of Easter. Now, that's interesting because next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. By the way, you're supposed to wear red when you come to church on Sunday next week. Pentecost Sunday, birthday of the church event. Well, then. The question is, if you just go from the 6th to the 7th Sunday of Easter and then on to Pentecost, we're missing something there. Something doesn't quite compute. And what is it? It's what happened last Thursday. So let's do the math here first. Jesus dies on the cross, Good Friday. He right, dies on the cross. He's buried, raised again on the third day, which is Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday plus 40 days will take you to Thursday. So this Thursday is Ascension Day. It's an extremely important event. And how important is this? Well, think about this for a minute. Jesus died on the cross. He rose. He appears, there are 10 recorded post-resurrection appearances in the New Testament. Well, what happened to him then? I mean, did you see him walking around in Connecticut last weekend? If he defeated sin and death and rose from the dead, you can't have him like wandering around. You have to, have, in a literary sense, you have to have some closure, don't you? Right? And does that make sense? Yeah. Jesus, the word became flesh. It's a time and space event. So that means you have to have a time, a chronology, in order to make the story work. Ascension is essential. And it's one of the most important, but yet one of the most neglected uh, feasts in the church calendar. Because why? It's a Thursday. Okay, would you come to church on Thursday, Thursday night at 7? Okay, let's be honest here. No. I have to watch Jeopardy. They're having the championships or something this week. You know? No, we're not. You can't get a big crowd to come out on a Thursday night. However, back in the Middle Ages, it's, it would be a holy day of obligation where, you know, you shut down your, your little shop and you have to go to church on that day. And it's essential when you tell the story of Jesus, right? Remember, what are the five letters you have to know the life of Christ? B, birth, life, death, resurrection, and what's the fifth one? A, ascension. You have to have that in order to tell the story of Jesus. Now, what's the birth? That's Bethlehem, Christmas, we like that. Life of Christ, Sermon on the Mount stuff, we like that. Death of Christ, that's Holy Week, Good Friday, we like that. Resurrection, that's Easter. But then, all of a sudden, the fifth point, the A point, is like neglected and forgotten. And I don't know what, they just sort of like, well, let's just skip over Thursday and go right to the interesting stuff on uh, uh, seventh Sunday of, of Easter. So it's important, I think, to kind of think about this event and the importance of it. Now, first of all, is this some kind of, a, some kind of an embarrassing concept? Let's be honest here, yeah, it is, right? There are some people that run around who don't do the research that claim the bee never happened. There never was a Jesus. Remember Christ is made up by drunken monks in the Middle Ages or something. Life of Christ, it's just some interesting philosophy, Sermon on the Mount. But when you get to the resurrection part, is that a hard thing? He died and he was buried, but he rose again on the third day. That's a choke point for a lot of people, but this one really gets them. He ascended up into heaven. Is that a problem? We know the ancients believe there's a three-story universe. What's that? Hell below, earth in the middle, and heaven above. Do we believe that? Not really. You were all out last night. Mrs. Isaac was out at like 2 o'clock in the morning looking for the aurora borealis, right? Now, that's like the second cosmic event in recent time. We had the eclipse a couple of a month or so ago, right? So do we know what causes these things? In the Bible days, if this happened, what would you have said? The gods are angry with us, right? The heavens are the turmoil in heaven. There's something going on with Zeus or something, right? But for us, we know that it's solar flares. We have to know the timing. We could predict where, the, uh, where your cell phone coverage is gonna be uh, uh, you know, disrupted. You know, we're, we're, we have the scientific method, so we know what happens. So if you'd say to a scientific person, that would be us, right, post-scientific revolution. Well, Jesus went to this place and then he went up in the sky. You would say, well, did he have like one of those strap-on packs, you know, like a battery pack? Was he beamed up like Star Trek or something? So what happens? We tend to 
Think about things in scientific categories. And what do we do with a text like this? Don't overthink it. It's important. Just let the word stand. Nuda verba, the bare word. Just let it stand. Okay? So let's, let's unpack it a little bit here and see if we can get some uh, details on this. First of all, we started with a gospel lesson today. Bonnie was all upset. She didn't know what the heck. You know, you're disrupting the order of things. You read the gospel first because Luke comes first and then comes the sequel, the book of Acts. Luke is basically a biography of Jesus, his ministry. Acts is a story of the, the early church. Okay, so it's like part one and part two. So there's an overlap here, and the overlapping story is the ascension story. So at the very end of our gospel reading today, we have he goes to Bethany, he lifts up his hands, it's a five-point thing that he did, uh, and he he's ascends into heaven. Then we turn to Acts, that's what Vani read. In the book of Acts, we have the overlap, and the link again is the ascension of Jesus. So the ascension ties the book of Luke and the book of Acts together into one volume. Uh, what, is there another tie? Yeah, the first book is written to Theophilus. Okay, what does that mean? Theos means God, Philo means love. God, God lover, one who loves God. That's, the guy, that's a person's name. And we think he's a high-ranking Roman official, maybe even a patron of Luke. He helped pay for the writing of these, of these two gospels or the gospel and the book of Acts. So he's, volume one, Acts, is written to Theophilus, so is volume two, the book of Acts, okay? So what is Luke trying to do? He's trying to fill in Theophilus and tell him the story of what? B-L-D-R-A. And the ascension is a key linker here, okay? So let's talk about this now. Let's do the geography first. Where does it take place? Luke and Acts is obsessed with Jerusalem, okay? And what is it about Jerusalem? Remember, this is the Temple Mount here, and that's the Kidron Valley, and that wall over there is the Mount of Olives. Have we heard of the Mount of Olives before? Yes, we have, Pastor Mark. When? Remember Palm Sunday. That wasn't that long ago. Where did the Palm Sunday march begin? The Mount of Olives. He starts over here, he goes down the hill, and he enters what? The city of Jerusalem. He goes into the temple, and he cleanses the temple. Now, let me talk about the temple for a minute. I could do like a 10-hour lecture on the second temple. It's fascinating stuff. Now, the second temple is what? The Axis Mundi. What is that phrase again? Axis Mundi. It means the center or the navel of the universe. Extremely important. So, they believed that the temple's here, the Holy of Holies is there, and above the Holy of Holies, there's a window that connects the earth and the heaven. Okay? It's the connector point. The wormhole that connects heaven and earth is above the temple in Jerusalem. It's the center, the axis mundi of the Jewish religion. Now, why did Jesus ascend to heaven on the Mount of Olives? The Mount of Olives is like right here. It's in the city of Jerusalem, and there's that portal that connects you to heaven. So he didn't ascend to heaven up in Galilee somewhere, you know, Nazareth or something. You know, no, it's, it's here in Jerusalem. It's the portal, the gate, the stairway to heaven, right? The stairway to heaven is this temple. That, that's why a reader would say, wow, this happened in Jerusalem, the temple. Now stop. When was the temple destroyed? August 10, 70 AD. Is that a crisis? It's a crisis for the Jews and also a crisis for the early Christians. The place that we thought was the Axis Mundi, the navel of the universe, the portal that connects you to heaven, has been annihilated by the Romans. In other words, the gate is closed. You can't, you can't get to heaven anymore from that spot. Therefore, what do we do now? What do we do now? Matthew, Matthew 28, doesn't end with the ascension. It ends with the promise of Jesus saying, Go into all the world, preach, and make, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right? So, so you don't need a temple because we have Jesus. With Jesus, where two or more are gathered, he is present with us. Okay? That, that, that's essential. But here's the problem. What does Luke do? What's his solution? If Jesus rose from the dead, and he did, how do we know? Remember? Nail holes in the hands, put the hand in the side. He eats the fish. He teaches you how to read the Old Testament. 
He appears 10 times between Easter Sunday and Ascension Day, 10 post-resurrection appearances recorded, right? So we know he rose from the dead. Well then, what did it look like? Is he a ghost or a phantom? No, it's right incarnate, in the meat, in the flesh. It's really him. The same Jesus that they crucified is the one who's now walking around. So what do you do with that? That's where the ascension comes in. The ascension is extremely important. And it takes place on the Mount of Olives over here. Okay, so let, let, let's, let's read a little bit. Um, um, okay, so uh, we talk about Theophilus, all right? And the, the, the risen Lord, right, teaches that he must suffer many things, right? So he suffers on the cross. He appears 40, for, during the 40 days. That's where we get the chronology from, that it's 40 days when Easter and, and Ascension Day. And he spoke about the kingdom of God, okay? Is that sort of important? The kingdom of God or the rule of God is essential, right? Who's running the show right now? It's the kingdom of the Roman Empire. Is that a problem? Yeah, that's an embarrassment. The Romans are pagans, polytheistic pagans, and they run the known world. And the Jews, since 63 BC, get to pay taxes and be humiliated on a daily basis by the Romans occupying their country, including controlling the Temple Mount. Okay? So the disciples want to know, well, when is the kingdom going to come? What does that mean? When are you going to do the revolution and kick out the Romans and all the corrupt people and establish your reign in Jerusalem? When is that going to happen? They still didn't understand it, even after the death, burial, resurrection, 10 post-resurrection appearances, three and a half years of teaching by Jesus, they still think he's, the, he's going to be the political military messiah. He, over and over again, he tells them, I'm the suffering servant. I die on the cross, right? Extremely important. Now, while he was there, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem. They're supposed to stay here. Why? Because Luke is obsessed with Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center, okay? Stay here. Where do they stay? Specifically, next week, they're in the upper room, the same room where Jesus gave the Lord's Supper on Monday, Thursday. That's where, they're, that's where they had to stay. The same room where the doors are bolted, and Jesus appeared to uh, the disciples minus St. Saint, uh, Saint Thomas. One week later, he appears to St. Thomas with the other disciples present. That's the upper room that's supposed to wait at. And that's going to be a uh, plot spoiler. The Holy Spirit's going to descend on Pentecost Sunday is next week. Okay, so the geography is extremely important. Stay in Jerusalem. In other words, don't go back to Galilee where you're from. And wait here for the promise of the, what's the promise of the Father? The Holy Spirit. Okay, ready? Here's the hand, here's the directions, right? Take your hand like this. What's the B? The birth of Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This way, okay? Then he lives down here, blah, 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 you know, life, death, resurrection. Then the ascension is this. So birth, ascension, then what? Does God just leave us alone? No. On Pentecost, there's another finger. It's this way. The Holy Spirit comes down. So because when Jesus goes up, the Holy Spirit comes down. It's like this. Okay? So extremely important to get the directions in mind here. Um, stay here, right? Um, stay here for the Holy Spirit. Okay, skip down a little bit. Um, they came together. They asked Jesus again, right? It, it, it's unbelievable. Lord, is this the time when you'll restore the kingdom to Israel? Again, they can't get past the idea that he is the suffering servant who died on the cross to take away our sins. They want, they still want, are waiting for the political revolution to take place. Again, is your problem a political problem? Uh, no. You would think by watching the news, if we got rid of Trump and had Biden, or if we got rid of Biden and had Trump, and all your problems would be solved. The problem is, after the election, you're still stuck with you when you look in the mirror. Okay? Extremely important. Your problem is not a political problem. Your problem is a spiritual problem on the inside. Change yourself. Deliver the world one reform unit. That would be you. Good place to start, right? Um, so, no, they, they, they want a political revolution. Still, when is it going to be? When is it going to be? And what does Jesus say? Take a note. He says, it is not for you. Okay, who is you? That would be the disciples that are there, but it also includes us right here. It's not up for you to know the times or the seasons or the periods. What does that mean? It, the word is chronos, like chronology, and kairos means like the immediate moment. So it's not up to you to know the immediate moment or the chronology of Christ's second coming. 
Extremely important. Do people make that mistake? Yeah, there's literally hundreds of people that have calculated and predicted when Christ is going to come again. And I always get a kick out of these people. Usually they're on TV and they want you to send you all, send all your money to these people. You know, Pasadena, California, send all your money. Well, if Christ is coming again, you probably, probably don't need my money. But no, they forget that part. You're supposed to send them the money because the world is going to end next week. So hundreds of people have tried to predict this over the years. And do people believe this stuff? Yeah. People are captivated by apocalyptic scenarios and post-apocalyptic movies and post a lot. Everything is an apocalyptic event. The world's going to end if we don't do this immediately. Okay, so people are obsessed with that stuff. But Jesus says it's not up to you to know the time or the season, right? Why? Because the Father alone knows. The Father has set this aside for his own. So the Father is the one that blows the whistle and goes, game over. Not you. You don't have any control over that, okay? Now, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit will come into you. That's next week. And you will become witnesses. Okay, what's a witness? A witness means martyr, witness, testimony, bear testimony, bear witness. That's, what, that's your job, okay? I was lost, but now I'm found. I'm blind, but now I see. That's your job to say that, to bear testimony. And where? Geographic again. Starts here in Jerusalem, right here. And it's going to um, it's gonna go to Judea and Samaria. And then it's going to go to the ends of the earth. It's like the book of Acts is a series of concentric circles that starts in Jerusalem and ends in Rome. How is it that the gospel of God spread? That's the book of Acts job to explain that. So it's a little bit of a literary foreshadowing here. Now, so this is what he's telling them, right? That he's teaching them right up to the moment that he leaves. Is that sort of important? Yeah. In other words, we need to keep learning in life. You need to keep learning. It isn't like, I graduated, I got my diploma at the impressive graduation ceremony, I never have to read a book again. No, all your life you need to continue le learning, especially things relating to Jesus and God and the Bible. It's a continue, it's a lifelong project. Oh, you're always learning something new. So he's teaching them right up to the moment that he leaves. I think that's fascinating, you know? Now, while uh, he was going, Right? Okay, so he takes them out where? If you read the Luke account, they go from the upper room here across town over here to the Mount of Olives. That's where, the story that's where today's story takes place. And they're on the Mount of Olives, and as they're going, right, um, suddenly, okay, what, he, 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 he's teaching them, and at that moment, He's lifted up in a cloud and it took him out of their sight. Okay, stop. Is this a hard thing? What do you do? Go with the program, right? The ascension is important. Now, do we say this a lot in, the, in church? Yeah, you're familiar with the Apostles' Creed, right? Um, he, he ascended to the dead. He, on the third day, he rose again. Uh, he ascended to the Father, sitteth on the right hand to God the Father. We say it in the Apostles' Creed every week, but we, do we really stop and think about what that means? It's this story, okay? Why did he ascend to heaven? He ascended to heaven, one, it's a literary thing. You have to have, if Jesus rose from the dead to feed us, you have to do something with him. He, he did. Did he go to Tibet? What happened to him? He has to ascend, okay? The next thing, he's doing something. He's at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. What does that mean? That is the world out of control? Yeah, down here might be out of control, but God is still on the throne. You see? So God still reigns in majesty above, and Jesus is at the right hand of God. That's the power seat. Now, is life full of transitions? That's what your life is, full of transitions, right? Today, what day is it today? Mother's Day. So I'm thinking about my mother, right, today. She died. Linda's thinking about her mother, right? We think about our mother on a day like this. And we maybe think about our daughters, our grandchildren. We think about how we fit into that. Linda has a great thing in her back room. You have to, when you come up for communion, look at this. It's an 1850 uh, print, and it shows the life of a, of a woman. Life of a woman. You know, some farm woman in upstate New York. So you're born. You become like a little girl, then you become a young maiden, and then you're married, and then you have a, you have a child, then you're middle-aged, and then you start declining, 
and then next thing you know, you're, you're an invalid, you can't walk anymore, and then it ends with the death, the death scene here. Life is full of transitions. Is that a hard thing? Some people have a hard time accepting the fact that you're going to get older and you're going to die. We live in a culture, it's a death-denying culture, right? No, you, if you're a woman, you're not a valid human unless you look like you're 14 years old, right? The cosmetics industry, the fashion industry, everything is geared toward, oh no, you can't be a middle-aged woman or older woman. That wouldn't, no, you can't have that. Well, that's a denial of reality. Reality, life is full of transitions, right? We're born, we live, we die. Same thing, just like BLDRA, it's a transition. When you go from one phase of life to another, is it an easy thing? It creates stress, doesn't it? What's going on right now? Graduation, right? And what happens then? Maybe they get married. And if they get married, then they have a kid. And they might get a job. And you might get transferred to another state. You might get laid off. That's a transition, isn't it? You might get divorced. You might have a death of a spouse. You might have something like um, uh, the economy crashes. You know, the stock market, you know, uh, crashed in 2009. You might lose 30% of your income or something, right? Happens all the time. Life goes in cycles. Life is full of transitions. You go from one phase to another phase. Or sometimes people retire. Is that an easy thing? Sometimes people retire, and guess what? It's the worst thing that ever happened to them, right? I talk, I'm a mason and an odd fellow, so I talk to the guys all the time. And what's the first thing you say? You don't say to them, show me pictures of your grandchildren. Um, what color did you paint the bathroom uh, this weekend? We say things like, what do you do for a living? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing you ask another man. What do you do for a living, right? And if you say, well, I used to do this or I retired or whatever, somehow you're not as valid of a person as you were when you say, I work in the engineering department or I do this. So sometimes people's identity is their job. And when you retire, it's like somehow you become a non-person in our society. What a horrible thing, right? So that's why it's important to have, to have a task, have something to do in your assigned position in your, life, in your life. Transitions, going from one to another. Here, Jesus is doing a transition, isn't he? Right? He did, he did the bee, the life, the, the birth, the life, the death on the cross, the resurrection. And he taught right up to the last moment and he ascends into heaven. And what are we supposed to do? Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis. Read the book. It's a devotional book from, I think, around 1400. It was one of John Wesley's favorite books. You're supposed to imitate Christ. What would Jesus do? Jesus goes through transitions because he really lived. He's a real person. We go through transitions, right? It's part of the human condition. He's 100% human, 100% divine. So his transition, he goes to the, the Mount of Olives and he ascends into heaven. And, he, and a cloud takes him up. Again, it's a hard thing, isn't it, for us to figure out. Well, just go with it. Don't, don't, don't waste time speculating, you know. Now, here's where it gets interesting. While he's going up, they were gazing up toward heaven. Okay, stop. If this was us, what would we be doing? We'd all be standing on the Mount of Olives like this, looking at our cell phones. <laughs> We wouldn't be looking up, we'd be looking down. Or maybe a few of us would have to try to take pictures of this. You see like two feet going up into the cloud, okay? We, we spend a lot, so much of our time looking down that we miss life, right? So we may like put the phone down once in a while and talk to a living person once in a while. It's good for you to talk to someone who's actually, you know, a, a real human being that's in the flesh, not a virtual person, right? And, um, and so while they're, they're looking up into heaven, I can just see them now. Golly, what did you happen here? I can't quite figure it out, right? So suddenly, two men in white robes stand by. Stop. Is that interesting? This is delicious, right? Have we heard of two men in dazzling white standing by before? Yeah. At the resurrection, they entered the tomb, and here's the place where Je the dead Jesus was laid out, and there were two men, one at the head and one at the feet, like the Ark of the Covenant with the two cherubim on the top, right? And what do those angels, or what do those people in white, the white young men, what do they do? They interpret the event. They tell you what happened. He is not here, he's risen, okay? 
Here, the two men in white give the interpretation. But wait, there's more. Can you name a couple people in the Bible that didn't die normal deaths? I can. Enoch. He lives 365 years. He's taken up into heaven. Okay? The next one we have is Moses. What happened to him? Deuteronomy 34. He went out and he died and God buried him. No one knows where. The legends, the Jewish legends of the first century is that he was taken up into heaven. Who else? Elijah. The prophet Elijah. What does he do? The prophet Elijah gives his mantle to Elisha and he's taken up into heaven. Wait a minute. Do we know the story of the transfiguration of Jesus? Yes, we do. On a mountaintop, Mount Transfiguration, Jesus goes with Peter, James, and John. And who are the two people that are speaking to him? Two men in white, Elijah and Moses. Ooh. Maybe these two men in white are not angels. Maybe it's Moses and Elijah. I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting to think about that. Yeah. Could have been angels, could have been Moses and Elijah. Luke, I think he kind of makes it ambiguous just to ruin your day. <laughs> Isn't that great though? I think that's delicious. So there's two men. And what do the two men do? They interpret for us. Stop. Why do we like Moses? Why do we like Elijah? Moses is the king of the Torah. Elijah is the king of the prophets of the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus is here to what? Fulfill the 333 Messianic prophecies. So the, the whole Bible is a book about Jesus, including the Old Testament. You see? So it's kind of like a little link here. The risen Lord taught us how to read the Old Testament. It's a book about who? Jesus. The law and the prophets, they speak of me. So these two men are there. And what is their message? How do they interpret the message? Again, you know, I, I do this all the time. The Battle of Gettysburg is when? July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 1863. What does the Battle of Gettysburg mean? Abraham Lincoln, November 19th, 1863, does the Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago. He gives us the meaning of this slaughter that took place, the biggest land battle in North American history. How about Franklin Roosevelt? Right, December 7th, 1941 is Pearl Harbor. What did he say? Yesterday, December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. He defines the day, he interprets the, the day with the speech that he gave on what happened yesterday. So that's what's going on here. The two men in white are interpreting the day for us. It's not just a random event. He said, men of Galilee, who's that? That would be the 11 apostles, they're all from Galilee. Remember Judas was from Judea and he's, he's now out of the picture. So they're all from Galilee, up north. Why do you stand looking up at heaven? Is that sort of an interesting question? What does the church do? The church is a place, again, it's a mouth house where we learn about the life of Jesus and what our mission is, is to get out of the world and to make disciples, right? You're not supposed to become like monks where we shave our head and we're cloistered and we just sit here and do religious things all day while the world is all going to hell. You're supposed to get out you come to church, you get your battle ration, then you get into the world and you fight the good fight. Do we need to fight the good fight today? Yeah, Christians need to be salt and light now more than ever. They don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear about your Jesus. We don't want to hear about your religion. You're stick in the mud, you're boring people. We don't want to hear about that. Just be quiet, stifle. Now we need to speak up, right? Um, we need to speak up in a crazy world. So you don't just stand there looking at, I'm going to stay on the Mount of Olives forever and just stand and look up at heaven at the gaping hole in heaven. I'm going to stand there like that. Well, you're not any good to God in heaven and you're not any good to people on earth that way. Right? You have the event. The ascension is an important event, but you're supposed to get out and do something about it. This Jesus, what Jesus? This Jesus. This Jesus right here. Who's he? The one that was born. The one who lived, the one who died on the cross, the one who was buried, the one who rose again. This Jesus, the same Jesus that was just talking to you, teaching you up to this last moment, that took you to the Mount of Olives. This Jesus who ascended into heaven, he will come again in the same way. Is that sort of important? 
Again, people are all confused about the second coming of Christ. They try to set dates, they try to scheme, they try to plot. They, I'm David Koresh, I'm, 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 I'm the new Jesus here. Yeah, that's me. Well, the Bible doesn't say he's going to return as a ratty-haired, failed rock musician who drinks Diet Pepsis and buys the newspaper at the 7-Eleven outside of Waco every day and lives in a compound. Jesus is not going to return to Waco, Texas. He's going to return where? In the same way. How did he leave? What's the ascension? How did he do it? Well, he went where? To Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. He went there, and he went up into heaven. So in other words, when he, how is he going to, in a clouds, clouds. How is he going to return? The same way. In the clouds, and he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives, mm -hmm. right? And that's going to be the second coming of Christ. Yeah, but why wouldn't he go to Connecticut, or why wouldn't he go to Chicago, or why, why would, because Jerusalem is the axis mundi, mm -hmm. right? Jerusalem's the center. Is Jerusalem sort of um, important like right now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's in the news right now, right? What, what's going on? To the river, to the sea. We have to get all the Jews out of Israel because the, it, Jerusalem is the third holiest site in Islam. Muhammad had a dream that he ascended to heaven from the Dome of the Rock that's, that's in Jerusalem. Is that a problem? Yeah, because Jews aren't welcome there. Well, that's the holy, that's the axis mundi for the Jews. That's really what the fight is all about. Who controls Mount Zion? Zionist Mount Zion, right? So, you know, the, the Jerusalem is still important today, just like it was 2,000 years ago. Just like it was 4,000 years ago, right? So, he's going to return again. He's going to come again in the same way. And he will come in the same way as you saw him go up into heaven. The ascension is extremely important. And again, we gloss over it. It's on a Thursday, we just go right on to Sunday, right on to Pentecost, and we miss the, this very important idea that Jesus was here, he taught us, he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again, and after 40 days he appeared 10 times, he went to the Mount of Olives and he ascended into heaven. And the people who wrote the Bible, the New Testament, they were witnesses to this event and they passed it on to us so that we might believe. Extremely important, and it completes the story of Jesus. When we say the Apostles' Creed, listen to every article, every line in the Creed, and pay attention when they say, He ascended into heaven. That's what we talk about today the Feast of the Ascension. Amen.